God's peace be with you as we continue our journey through Holy Week. Um, today we look at our Old Testament reading from this past Sunday for, for Palm Sunday, and it's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 36 to 39. These verses actually, um, you know, they come at the end of Deuteronomy, just just before Moses dies, and, and um, it's recorded as a uh, large song or a psalm um, that was composed by Moses, and uh, these these verses find their way about two thirds of the way through, but here as we listen to this, it's it's taken as well um, in its prophetic sense as pointing not only to to Christ, who, whom um, the Lord allows to die, He kills in order to um, win our salvation, um, but then also it's this beautiful gospel message that um, in our helplessness, God is still faithful. Um, you know, and the way that Paul writes in in, in his his letters as well, where uh, if we are faithless, he he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And as we listen to all of this again, preparing for this this year's Good Friday celebration, um, it, it's listening again that these these events of Holy Week, um, this gift of the cross of the crucified Savior, this gift of God's love and his grace is is something that um even even when we've wandered far away from from the gospel from church from from um that christian faith um the gift is still valid um and, and he calls us back to to be part of it and that's really what that that picture of repentance is as it comes together in the scriptures it's returning to the lord um even when we've wandered away so as we begin, let's let's open with a word of prayer as well. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you on this day so that um, recognizing all of the blessings that you have won for us in Christ, um, that you call, call upon us to come and stand before you to receive them. Um, guide us always by your Spirit so that we would always return to to our Savior, um, not in an abstract way, but in the very concrete way in which he calls us to meet him through his word and in the sacraments where he's promised to, to give us all of these gifts of life and salvation that he wins for us on the, by his death on the cross. But bless us as we consider these words as well and as we look at our lives so that rather than fearing our own, our, our own you know, damnation or our own you know, weakness, that we would build instead upon your greatness, the greatness of your Son, the glory which you reveal to us there in this death on the cross. Bless us as we continue this week and as we continue our journey to, to celebrate again that marvelous re reality of, of your salvation that you've prepared for us. This we pray for in the name of Jesus our crucified Savior. Amen. Well, these verses here, and especially the opening verses, um, the very first verse, it's used in the right, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 as a way to warn people not to not to ignore Christ. And, and um, that becomes one of those real challenges in our world today where people, well, people have this idea that, that along the way somehow Jesus has become irrelevant in our world and so we have to rejig Jesus in order to be more socially, um, fit into the social culture. Um, we, we can't, we can't because what Christ has done, he's done um, for us and for our salvation. And so as we listen to these words, it's that call and that reminder for us, where verse 36, the Lord, and again, um, if you're looking through one of your, um, if you're using the bulletin insert from Sunday that's been emailed around, or if you're using your, your translations, that the Lord there is, is small caps, and it means that underneath the word, and the, the actual word in the Hebrew is Yahweh. The Lord will vindicate his people. Some translations have judge his people, and, and, and the, the, word, the words are tied together. Um, but the Lord will vindicate his people, using the translation that I've got here in front of me, the ESV, and have compassion on his servants. And this is why vindicate is often used, to, um, used in the translation, in some of these translations, because there's, there's the sense that um, 
God's judgment will fall, yes, but God's judgment, um, which ultimately is placed on Christ, still leads to grace for us who are found in him. Um, for those who come before him, um, who, who, those who, who um, trust and have that faith in him. Um, because as we see God's work in Christ, we see that God's, um, his wrath and his anger, yes, is against sin, but it's not against sin in such a way that he desires to destroy us, but that he wants all people to be saved, and that Jesus is the way and through which he does that. So the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Listen to that, compassion. That's a, that, that, that's a um, filled word. Um, it, it's a loaded term um, where compassion isn't just love saying, oh, isn't that nice? And then and, uh, the modern sense of, you know, um, Valentine love where you've got these, these um, bubbly feelings, which has more to do with infatuation and the way in which culture talks about it. Um, it it's a deep-seated love which drives a person to action, but then also the compassion in the sense that he suffers with us where God will have compassion on his people, where he suffers with us in our brokenness, our sin, um, when he sees that their power is gone and that there is none remaining bond or free. And these are these beautiful words from the end of Deuteronomy, um, just before, and, and from, from the mouth of Moses and the pen of Moses here, where it's this reminder that that God's love and compassion is is not necessarily there for the strong or the ones that pat themselves on the back and say look at how great I am but it's there for us in in our our absolute weakness and so even at the moment that we feel completely powerless um, and, and where you know all all hope seems to be gone God's compassion is there and this is where this verse begins so that in verse 37, we continue to build. Errol found a squeaker there. Then he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge. So even the people, um, and this becomes one of these mind-boggling things. It's not that we should ever encourage people to chase after other gods, but um, or, or to worship you know, false deities or chase after multiple religions as though all religions are the same because if you look at them, they're really not. Um, you know, and I know that's one of those popular ideas that sometimes people say, well, all religions are the same. They just teach you to be good. Um, but that's, that's, that's basically a works righteousness kind of a look. And, and if you take a look at what the religions actually claim, not only about what goodness looks like, it's very different in some cases. But then also the other side is, is that, you know, how God works out our salvation. Um, Christianity does not say, and we hear this again right here, that it's by works, but it's by God's grace when we're powerless in our weakness. Basically, then God will say, he says, where are their gods, the rock in which they took refuge? When the people are powerless, and sometimes he allows us to encounter that powerlessness in our own experience of our lives, where we try to build on ourselves or we try to build on, you know, you know, chasing after all kinds of different things that we think are going to create safety. And I sometimes wonder if the, if the political strife, not only Ukraine, but across Canada and all over the place, um, is, is perhaps the Lord um, allowing us to, to reach the limits of our own foolishness, if, if we can use that word, our own folly, thinking that we will create the perfect society if only we can push and get everybody to do the same thing and think the same way that we do. When at the heart of the matter is, is that because of sin, um, all we do is we, we create worse problems for ourselves without that call to humility, that call to grace, that call to our Heavenly Father's love that spills over from Christ on the cross in which we're called to share in the same measure. Um, as we hear these things, you know, this whole sense that, you know, the Lord will have compassion on his servants at that moment when we find ourselves most powerless, it's that call and that reminder that even in the midst of the crazy brokenness of our hearts and of the world, um, God's love does not dry up or change. 
gods? Where are their gods in the rock in which they took refuge? Who sits at the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and let them be your protection. And, and that whole phrase and that whole, that whole um, you know, quote right there from Deuteronomy, um, from Moses' psalm, Basically, you know, the, the Lord through Moses, but yes, Moses is mocking, mocking the sense that, you know, all of these different things that we claim are going to create peace, they really don't. They, they, they increase strife. You know, look at the identity politics running around today that's supposedly supposed to make society so much better. It's actually dividing people further and further apart. Um, where are their gods? It's that question for us to reflect on as well or the way that luther raises the question in connection to the large um, first commandment in the large catechism you know what is it to have another god and it's basically it's it's uh, where we look for our greatest good where do we look for our greatest good and i know the easy you know intellectual answer is is you know we, we look to god we look to christ you know the good christian catechism answer but if we look deeper in our hearts, is that really the case? You know, I'm, I'm always um, reminded of this when, you know, when I speak to some of our African friends, our Romo friends especially, where, you know, one time, you know, there was a fellow that uh, spoke with one of the Romo guys and basically says, yeah, it's my birthday today, I'm going to go out drinking and I'm going to do all these sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, this this other the, the Romo fellow says why why would you do that? It's, it's a good day to give thanks to God. It's, you know the better response would be I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give thanks to God and stand before my Creator, my Savior, my Redeemer. Um, you know all these sorts of things. And it's not a matter of saying that celebrating with friends is necessarily wrong, but notice what happens to our priorities. Um, you know we're we, we we live such a, a life nowadays and we're formed in such a life where we look to other things in order to celebrate rather than to stand before God and give thanks. And it's worth asking ourselves why. And this is part of what all of that is, okay? The other gods and then the rock in which they, they look to go and take refuge in these other deities. Who ate the fat of their sacrifices? Basically, you go and and worship at at the altar of that particular deity um, along the way, and then drink the wine of their drink offerings. And, and basically, the way Moses is saying, if that's where you're worshiping, you know, let them help you. Let them figure it out. And, and as we take a look and as we take a listen to that, you know, um, where we spend our devotion and our time um, becomes this important question for us to ask. Are we worshiping that as our God rather than Christ our Lord and our Savior through whom salvation has not only been worked but revealed and is given? Are we chasing after this rather than going to receive these gifts that Christ himself gives? And, and as we hear this, um, it's a good mirror for us to hold before our eyes um, during this Holy Week. You know, how far have we wandered? Are we people that have basically taken that faith for granted and said, but I'll do it my own way and I'll find my salvation here. And yeah, Jesus will stay over there, but I don't want to interact. Even there, that invitation is for us to return to the Lord, to come back in order to be not only renewed in that grace and forgiveness, but you know, as we celebrate this Holy Week, to behold our Savior the foot of the cross as we listen to that account of the crucifixion again um, so that as we hear all of these all of these things unfold before us we see not simply just something in history but instead the love of our lord of our god of our savior who humbles himself even to the point of death on the cross in order to be that savior for all of us and as he invites us to come and be part of that. But verse 
39 switches gears, though, from where Moses goes with all of those words, where he points out, and this goes back into the words of the Lord, and we can hear it in a couple of different ways, both in the way in which, you know, the Lord speaks to the people of, of old, reflecting back um, on, on the, the way in which the Lord not only killed and destroyed the enemies in order to rescue his people Israel out of, out of Egypt and bring them into the promised land, but then also in the very real sense that this whole sense of the Lord killing and making alive um, points to the resurrection where in Christ he does the same thing, where Christ, well, the way Paul puts it, he became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, a baptismal exchange. Um, Christ becomes the greatest of enemies upon which the wrath of God is placed because of the sin that he takes upon himself so that we can have life in his name and be made friends. We hear this in these words where Moses writes and he sings and he puts, well, ink to paper. See now that I, even I, am he. These are the words of God. And there is no God besides me. So beside all of these other things that people claim are gods or go and worship, they're not really gods. The God that we have is the God who broke into the existence of our world through the incarnation of Christ in order to die for us. That's where we see the glory of God, the love of God. Um, and then he says, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And like I said, you know, there's that you know, historical reflection looking back on the way in which the Lord rescued the people of Israel through all of the plagues and through all of the, the trials and through the Red Sea and their wanderings in the desert. The Lord is the one who is the Lord of life and death, but most importantly, looking forward to Christ from the Old Testament perspective. He is the one that sends his son, well, to be sacrificed on the cross, to be killed on the cross carry our sins and then to make him alive the resurrection to wound him the way that Isaiah writes about how he was wounded for our transgressions and to heal so that by his wounds we are healed and there's none that can deliver out of my hand so that basically as we come before our Lord and we place ourselves in his hands the wounded hands of Christ those wounds are there um, to show us that God takes, well, the, the punishment that we deserve because of our brokenness, he takes it onto himself in order to give us his life in exchange. The hands of God revealed on the cross become the hands of his sacrifice for us, of his love. For us, of his grace for us, of his wide open arm invitation to receive us back so that no matter how far we've wandered away from the Lord in our own stubbornness or our own pridefulness or our own, you know, um, whatever it is that's, that, that has kept us away from church, from the altar, from the sacraments, from the word, there's this beautiful passage here and the beautiful gospel message of this week that the invitation is for us to come. Come home the way that we heard with the prodigal son, you know, the gracious father who waits eagerly for, for his children to return home. Come home and then wraps his arms around them in order to receive them with that great joy and that great celebration. There's no sin that our Lord has not died on the cross to forgive and to renew that forgiveness and life in us. So come home, return to the Lord. There's no, yeah, no, no element in our lives where we can say that, you know, I'm so bad or so, you know, been so foolish that you know, Jesus would never receive me back. It's usually the devil spurring us on through those words or through other people's words. But the words of God and Christ are very different. It's basically return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful 
He is slow to anger and abounds in steadfast love. So that as we celebrate this week, come home, come home. Be a part of that death and resurrection of Christ that we've been baptized into. And if you haven't been baptized, let's get you baptized so that we're joined with Christ and made part of that member, you know, that body of Christ so that we are part of all of this. So that as we continue to gather, that we continue to build on, you know, Christ, our cornerstone, God's love himself on God himself as he steps into our world in order to be the one that delivers us out of sin, out of death, out of the hands of the devil, so that together with him, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we have not only that future promise, but that present reality, that gift of eternal life, which he plants into our hearts to keep us as his own, even today. So come home. We have our services this week. Um, Monday, Thursday service at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday evening, the night that Jesus was betrayed and instituted the Lord's Supper for us. 10 o'clock on Friday morning at St. James, Good Friday service, a service of readings, readings and hymns. And then, of course, our Easter morning services, 10 o'clock noontime service, two of them. Um, we have been asking people to call in just so that we can even out numbers for those services, just so that we're, but, but it's not a matter of, you know, we're not going to turn people away if you just show up. So come home, just come, just show up, and we'll be glad to have you. Because the Lord is glad to have us gather around the altar to receive those gifts and to fill our mouths with his praise. Amen. <laughs>